Chapter 14. The Mainland Colonies. British Guyana. Associated with the West Indian Islands are British Honduras in Central America and British Guyana in South America. British Guyana is the only British colony in South America, and it lies on the northeastern coast. Its eastern boundary is Dutch Guyana. Guyana is an Indian name meaning the watery land. The colony lies between the Orinoco River on the north, the Great Amazon River on the south and west, and the Atlantic Ocean on the northeast. It is well-named watery land, for stretching inland from the coast for a distance of 10 to 40 miles is a low-lying swampy plain formed by the mud and sediment brought down by many rivers and streams. Even the sea along the coast is brown with mud. The most developed portions of Guyana are those occupied by the three colonies, British, Dutch, and French Guyana. Brazil was once called Portuguese Guyana, and what is now Venezuela was once Spanish Guyana. Columbus sighted the coast of Guyana on his third voyage in 1498. The first settlements were made by the Dutch as early as 1580. Sir Walter Raleigh visited Guyana in 1595 and again in 1617. He made his way up the River Orinoco in an unsuccessful search for El Dorado, or the Golden, a legendary city of the Incas, said to have roofs and walls of gold and precious stones. The Dutch made a settlement on the Esquibo River in 1616 and on the Demerara and Berbiz in the following years. They were accustomed in Holland to the difficulties of low-lying land and encroaching sea, and they began at once to build dikes to force back the sea. Then they cut canals to drain the land. The reclaimed land was further drained by means of ditches, and the mud dugout was piled up to raise the level of the land. Having shut out the flood from outside, it was also necessary to make plans for draining off the heavy rainfall. This was done by cokers or floodgates, which were opened at low water and closed as the tide began to rise. At first, the soil of the reclaimed land was very salt, having been soaked in seawater. But when it had been thoroughly washed by heavy rains, it proved quite suitable for growing sugarcane. Dutch Guyana, made up of Suriname and Demerara, changed hands several times during the Napoleonic Wars when the Dutch were vassals of France. British adventurers made several attempts from the 16th century onwards to found colonies on the Guyanian coast. But these efforts met with little success, and it was not until the Treaty of Paris in 1814 that British Guyana really came into existence. The British territory is nearly twice the size of England, its total population is over 400,000, of whom about 87,000 live in Georgetown, the capital, and its suburbs. There are only a few British living in Georgetown, but there are many other races, including Negroes, East Indians, Chinese, and a few Native Indians. The cultivated parts of the British colony lie along the coast and stretch for a short distance from the rivers. The principal crops grown are sugarcane and rice. The rice fields are plowed by wooden plows drawn by oxen. Farther inland, the ground rises to a tableland 2,000 to 3,000 feet above sea level. In this region, there are dense forests with tall trees festooned with vines and creepers. One of the most valuable trees in these forests is the green heart, which gives a very hard wood useful for making piles, dock gates, and bridges. The sap of another tree, the balata, gives a kind of rubber used for insulating wires. There are 95 miles of railway, but the rivers are the main highways in British Guyana, and some of their rivers have falls and rapids of great beauty. The Kaitur Falls, called by the Indians the God of Waters, are over 800 feet high, nearly five times as high as the Niagara Falls. In the interior parts of the colony, over 5,000 Indians still live in the old-time villages, fishing, hunting, and growing crops of cassava. In the upper courses of the rivers, gold and diamonds are found. 
Most of the mining is carried on by little groups of men who are able to endure the hard life. They share the cost of buying a boat, tools, and other things needed, and work together, digging away the topsoil until they come to the pay dirt, as the gold-bearing gravel is called. Sometimes they're lucky enough to find a nugget, but there are many days when they get little or no reward for their hard work. Diamonds are worked in much the same way. There are some mines worked by mining companies with modern machinery. There are also mines of bauxite, which is used to make aluminum. The village ordinance of 1892 laid down a system of local government. For the coastal regions where the problems of keeping back the sea and draining the land are great and expensive, a district commissioner was appointed in 1932. He had to deal with the severe droughts in 1939-40 to 40 and floods in 1942-43. to 43. In 1928 and 1943, the constitution of British Guyana was altered. The Legislative Council was then made to consist of 24 members. 14 were elected, 7 nominated by the governor, and 3 were ex officio, the colonial secretary, attorney general, and colonial treasurer. The Constitution was altered again in 1953, providing for an upper and a lower house and the appointment of ministers. This Constitution was soon suspended, as we shall see later. The chief town of British Guyana is Georgetown, near the mouth of the Esquibo River. Lying below sea level, it is protected by a seawall a mile long, and many houses are built on piles driven into the swampy ground. In 1945, a disastrous fire caused 600,000 lira worth of damage to the town. New Amsterdam is also on the coast, Bartica. New Amsterdam is also on the coast. Bartica, the gateway to the gold mining area, and Mackenzie City, near the bauxite mines, are riverside towns. The British Guyana Airways, a government aided company, now provides means of reaching the interior. There are telephone and telegraph lines, a broadcasting station, and several wireless stations. Education is provided in 269 primary schools, and there are several government and private secondary schools. Much of British Guyana is as yet undeveloped, but its great forests and its extensive deposits of various minerals should help to ensure it a more prosperous future. British Honduras. British Honduras is situated in Central America. It is bounded on the east by the Caribbean Sea, on the north by Mexico, on the south and west by Guatemala. It is crossed by the River Belize, while the Rio Hondo and the River Sarstún form natural boundaries on the northwest and south. The earliest settlers were woodcutters who exported logwood and mahogany. They were known as Bay Men and were often attacked by Spaniards, for the surrounding territory was then entirely Spanish, which is still the main language in parts of the interior. Many of the 17th century settlers came from Jamaica. It was not until 1862 that Honduras became a colony, at first subordinate to the governor of Jamaica. In 1884, it became a self contained British colony. The greater part of Honduras is covered with dense forests. In the 17th century, logwood was in great demand for making black and dark blue dyes. Logwood got its name because it was exported in the form of logs. Another valuable forest tree is mahogany, giving a dark reddish-brown wood used for making furniture. The Spaniards, who claimed the whole of Central America, objected to the woodcutters settling in the region, and many of the small settlements were either broken up by the Spaniards or abandoned, until only those on the River Belize, the Bay Islands, and the Mosquito Coast remained. Other attempts were made by the Spaniards to drive out the British. The woodcutters fought back fiercely. In 1765, Admiral Burnaby sailed from Jamaica with a strong force and enabled the woodcutters to return to their settlements. On this occasion, the first code of laws, known as Burnaby's Laws, was drawn up. 
It was based on the ancient customs of the woodcutters. But more than a hundred years passed before the woodcutters' settlements became, in 1884, the colony of British Honduras. The forests are still the most valuable possession of British Honduras, and logwood, mahogany, and cedar are important exports. The timber is floated down the rivers in October and November, when the streams are high after months of heavy rainfall. Belize, the capital of the colony, is built on a beautiful harbor open to sailing vessels. But the water is too shallow for big ocean-going steamers to enter. These vessels anchor at some distance from the shore, and the mahogany and other woods, which have been made into rafts of about a hundred logs each, must be towed out by motorboats to be loaded onto the waiting ships. Another of the forest products is chicle, a Spanish word, which is a raw gum from which chewing gum is made. Although more than two-thirds of the colony is covered with forests, with millions of tormenting insects, there are cultivated lands along the coasts with plantations of sugar, bananas, grapefruit, pineapples, and coconuts. The Colonial Development Corporation has plans for the extension of these and the cacao and orange growing industries. Of a total population of over 80,000, nearly half live in Belize. The other towns, Stan Creek, Corozal, and El Cayo, have populations varying from 1,500 to 3,000. The rest of the people live in straggling villages along the riverbanks. Rivers were until recently the chief means of communication, but now the towns are connected by roads, with the exception of those in the south. In a number of the Maya Indian and Carib villages, old customs linger on. One of the villagers holds the title of alcalde and exercises some of the powers of a magistrate. In certain Maya Indian villages, under the old system of communal labor, the men can be called out to perform such tasks as cleaning up the village. Belize has an airfield, and there are regular air services to neighboring states and to Jamaica. <laughs>